I would normally say that uh, Terry Hightower needs no introduction, but there are some here that may not have heard him in the past, so I'll uh, introduce him. <coughs> he's born in Winter Haven, Florida, and he's our grandson evangelist, W.M. Barton. Poor wife, Vicki, is a daughter of Casey. He has a daughter, Casey, son, bred, grandchildren. How many grandchildren do you have? Four. Well, that's, that's, that's a good number. <laughs> Creature in Arkansas, Florida, Wyoming, Texas. And he's uh, put out a number of uh, electric shell books that are, uh, I think, classics. Uh, probably not in print anymore, but if you ever happen to... They're available on a CD now from Shenandoah. Okay, available from the CD. So I, I would suggest that you get uh, the uh, lectureship books that he edited because they're just uh, really classics. Now, you may notice that uh, he, he's a little bunged up. You know, he's got skinned up there, and he's got that blue thing. He's got a deep cut in the palm of his hand. And the reason for that is that he was, uh, you know, he is getting older, and he was walking between two vehicles and tripped and, and fell. Now the reason for the deep cut in his hand is that uh, he covered his mouth as he was falling and he was still talking and chewed a hole in his hand. <clears throat> and that's, you know, that's just the fact, you know, I might make no allusions to the fact that he's talking, but somebody said that uh, once he gets up here, he may never quit talking. I said, you just not understand the reality of it. You know, the Lord's going to come again sometime. <laughs> and I would remind him that to proclaim an eternal principle, you do not have to speak forever. <laughs> He's going to speak to us on the apostasy of the first century church. Do we need to get our Crayolas out and stuff? Right. Need to get the Crayolas out. I think you already have the uh, handout. And... Uh, you know, I know, know every adult has carries Crayolas with them, so uh, get that out. He's going to speak to us on the apostasy of the first century church, and uh, it will be very interesting, I know. Uh, when I heard I'd been assigned to stay in the Stevens home for the, this lectureship, I I wrote back to Sonia West and told her that I would rather stay in a home, you know, where the husband was a Christian in addition to the lady of the house. Uh, but Sonia wrote back only to point out that she said, well, Terry, you stayed with the Cones last year and seemed not to have a problem then with that same situation. So, I, you know, I said, you kind of got me, you know, there. And all that was left then, well, I was thinking, I was thinking about Ken Cone. And I just heard from one of the uh, kids since I've been here that Ken was teaching a, a children's Sunday school class and he was being a little bit on the pompous side with the kids. Uh, and he asked them, he was trying, I guess, to elicit some information from them, you know, about the Bible and so forth, uh, see if they knew, had learned some scriptures and so forth. But he said, he asked the kids, he said, why would people look at me and think I'm a Christian? And one of the kids finally spoke up and answered, because they don't know you. <laughs> well, uh, all that was left about staying uh, with someone this time, especially they was going to have to stay with eldership, uh, was then with the third elder, uh, Buddy Roth. And, you know, I was not about to room with a guy who thinks a microphone is a sweet potato or a banana. So that, eliminate, that eliminated that one right there. I mean, would you stay with someone who thought that, even if they are uh, in the eldership? Say, so I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm going to have to skip a bunch of material as usual, even though we're going to be traveling kind of fast uh, today. Uh, in the book, I'm not sure exactly what page it's on in this chapter, but you have the four charts uh, and, and hopefully in your hand, and you will need a pencil, uh, pen, or like he said, maybe uh, a Crayola of some sort. But I wanted you to notice an argument that we have uh, set forth, and that is this, 
and there's a syllogism on a certain page. I did not attempt, uh, look it up again in my book, but uh, we, we set forth an argument along this line that if A, God predicted that some would divide the unity of original Christianity, if God predicted that by departing uh, from, from them by departing from the faith, perverting the gospel, turning away from the truth, causing unscriptural divisions, and speaking perverse things. If God predicted that, and then B, imagine this now, if this could be possible. This is really what we call a counterfactual hypothesis. Uh, it can't be true. It's sort of like saying, if God could lie, and he were to say to you, well, God cannot lie, in fact, that's involved with this. It's a counterfactual hypothesis. It doesn't exist in reality, but we use it for the purpose of illustration. But notice point B then, su and such predictions fail to come true, then the Bible is not God's word. And that's really, it's a great argument, uh, really, as far as it uh, goes. It's just that uh, part of a premise here is, of course, the B part, uh, such predictions failed to come true. Imagine if that had happened, uh, that God predicted all of those things, and we're going to go through each one of them and take a look at it and cause you one, sort of one-on-one -on -one to, uh, to think about this and examine uh, this material for yourself. I use this, by the way, there's a footnote uh, there somewhere uh, towards the back in which uh, this material is stated as not being original with me, but I have adapted it uh, over the years. There's four sheets that are eight and a half by 14 that look about like this, eight and a half, 14 uh, sheets, four of them, and I suggest you get a hold of Joyce Massey, who is uh, Jim Massey's widow down in Florida, and we've given you some contact uh, points there, email and whatnot, to get a hold of her, and I suggest all of you get this, not just preachers, but all of us. I preach my way through these sheets, uh, uh, about eight lessons, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I just divide it up and do half of each of these sheets in one sermon, you know, a couple pages, then two more pages on, of the sheet in the next lesson. And teaching members of the church, not only are you teaching the audience, but you're teaching uh, brothers and sisters in Christ how to use these and to reach out to people to get a study and let someone see what the Bible actually says uh, about denominationalism, about the church, the falling away, and as we say, the restoration. And that's what this is about. I suggest that you get these sheets. I have changed some things in the, some of the uh, four pages that you now have, which is the first one uh, of these four sheets. It's only number one. That's all you have. You'll have to get the other uh, three from Sister Massey or, say, from me. I can uh, maybe run some off. She's given me permission about that. But this answers the question about why so many churches. That's a, that's a standard question. Why are there so many varied churches here in, in America, throughout the world, and so forth? Uh, and this material, I would say, is superb to be used with all denominationalists, but it's especially effective with Roman Catholics. And I've seldom uh, failed to baptize such individuals who agree to study and seriously go through this material since it makes clear to them from the Bible, not just on my word or my say-so, but it makes clear to them the falsity of the claim of Catholicism to be the original mother church. It is not. And when you go to the Bible, you see that when uh, it shows them really to be merely another human denomination. That's all they are, and we say that in kindness and love. If any of you are here or listening to me on the Internet at this time, or we'll hear it in the archive uh, presentations, that you can go and listen to all of these, uh, great, these lessons and, and learn from them uh, even in the future and suggest to your neighbors and friends that they go and listen to it. We're not meaning to uh, offend. We'll say we're not uh, meaning to offend, but if offense is necessary to cause a person to examine what they believe and hold and practice, then uh, the offense is going to be apparently necessary for some. Uh, to say, are, are you uh, in right relationship with God so that when you die, uh, will you go to heaven? Will you be saved? Are you a part uh, of the truth? Or, or perhaps could it, could it just be that you are a part of error? And you're going to see what God has said here in setting this forth to where denominationalism 
It's sort of the Bible simply explains it to us. It predicted it is what we are saying. And so we make that argument then uh, that uh, on that one page there, you could follow that. I'll not take time to go through the whole thing. But we know from Hebrews 6 and verse 18 that it's impossible for God to lie. Also, Titus 1 and verse 2. Uh, also, it's implied in the principle found in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 22 and many other verses. But we see that if God predicts all anything and then it does not come to pass, not only according to Deuteronomy 18, 22, are you not to uh, listen to this prophet uh, because then you know he's not from God because he's telling untruth. He's saying something which is not reality. Truth is just simply that which corresponds to uh, reality. That's what Buddy Ross seems to be having a little problem with about the banana and the, you know, things there in the microphone. Buddy, we're going to have to work with you on that one. Uh, but the fact is, don't we want to know what's real? That is the truth, is what is real. Christ and, and God never ask any of us, anyone in, in uh, history, in fact, to believe anything except that you have adequate evidence for it which proves or corroborates it and shows that it is the truth. It's not a situation of lay my hand over my heart and say, well, ever since I such and such, you know, in, in some cornfield out here, I have felt saved all my life. That is not what it's all about. It's about prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21. But we know that the fact is, uh, this is really an unsound argument since there's a false premise within it. B is not true. Let me reiterate that to you. B is not true. Such predictions fail to come true of any predictions that we're going to look at or any, in fact, predictions that God makes in Scripture anywhere about any subject. No, that is not the case, and that makes this an unsound uh, argument, although you can claim that it is valid. Uh, that these did not fail to come through, true. And thus, if denominationalism, we're saying, had not occurred. Think about this. Uh, it's, simp it's a simple explanation, uh, but yet in one way, maybe it is kind of profound because so many people seem to miss it. That if denominationalism had not occurred, uh, the Bible would be proven not to be God's divine and inspired word because he did predict it. Now let's look at it. Start with me on the sheet. We're going to try to move quickly. I hope that you'll be able to follow it. If you don't, you can go back and read it, of course, uh, in the book, which is basically what I'm uh, following. The church, the falling away, and the restoration, departures from the Bible. And so we're saying on page uh, one, I'm hoping you're looking, you see at the bar bottom of it, I think it's on page 39 in your book, but you have the sheet hopefully in your hand, and it says at the bottom, chart one. So be sure you're on that first page with us. Departures were predicted in the scripture. Have you ever wondered why there's so many different faiths in the world? When Ephesians 4 and verse 5 says one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Why, are the, why is there this proliferation of all these sectarian uh, groups? Uh, in fact, uh, the, in this series of lessons, we're going to explore how there came to be over approximately 1,200 faiths, put an S on the end of faith, just in North America alone, not even counting the rest of the world. Did you know that we count our 2012 calendar years? Now right now, uh, start getting into the habit of doing this, and I have the person sitting right beside me. They're here, I'm here, and then I'm instructing them as we go through this sheet and having them look up every verse and we take more time, of course, to let them examine and to be sure we're not pulling something out of context and so forth. We let them take it home and, and think about it uh, and then come back and ask questions if they want to. But right now, I want you to write on that front uh, first chart one, write 2012 under the word now. Write under the word now in the right-hand corner at the top, right above departures predicted, put 2012. In other words, that's, of course, our current uh, calendar year. And so that's the 2012, approximately from the birth of Jesus, which we call zero. Draw a, z draw a circle uh, with your pen or pencil around zero. I want you to get, you want to get a person involved in this, and you yourself in doing it, you want to be involved, and be careful to be sure that I'm not leading you astray, nor anyone else. Be sure that you see the point from the Bible, from God's word uh, itself. Now this means we're roughly what? Roughly 2,000 years after Jesus' birth. 
Now, in the Bible, we learn that Jesus was about 33 years old when he died, uh, which would be the year A.D. 33, and that uh, year, uh, at least for convenience sake, A.D. 33, that year Christianity began to unfold in, in much more of a complete sense, uh, and is represented by this drawing that we have at the top of the page there of the Bible. Now, in circle also, A.D. 33. So you're staying with me, and the person is staying with you uh, of what we're thinking and talking about here. We're getting a chronological perspective about what, ha what happened in the first century. By approximately the year 100, you see that we've printed it there, the writing of the Bible was completed. And from the beginning of Christianity in A.D. 33 then uh, uh, to our year now is 2,012 years during which time men have been departing from original Christianity. Now, write the word leave, L-E-A-V-E, -E, over the uh, point of the arrow at that little drawing right there. Write in L-E-A-V-E, -E, because that's exactly what happened, and we must realize that. Uh, the first uh, uh, verse, 1 Timothy uh, 4 and verse 1, on the sheet you'll notice, uh, and I'm going to have to uh, somewhat abbreviate this to keep going on through it. You'll take more time if you're st studying it on your own or you're teaching someone and using it one-on-one -on -one with a friend, a neighbor, uh, a relative, a son or daughter, or a grandchild or whoever. Uh, but in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, it foretold, and so by that we mean predicted, uh, circle the word predicted, departures predicted. God said it. Did it happen? If it hadn't, have, then the Bible is false. Throw it in the trash can and go on to the Koran or some other uh, so-called inspired book. Uh, but notice that men would depart from the faith and that they would then teach other faiths. Uh, that's not hard. None of these points are hard to understand. But for some reason, people do seem to have uh, some uh, disability almost to a handicap, if you will, to, to following and understanding. This explains what our present situation, how it came to be, how it came about. But the Spirit saith expressly that in later times some shall fall away from, look at it, the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. So write in the word depart right there. Spirit speaketh, and we've abbreviated it, shortened it down. Some shall what? Depart. Put the word, write the word depart. Have the person you're studying with write that in. Have them look back at the verse to see this is what God said about it. And they departed from what? From the faith. Not a faith. Circle the word the. Circle the word the. The faith. There's a definite positive doctrine set forth in the New Testament times uh, which could not be altered or changed. That's, folks, what we're all about. If you're a New Testament Christian, everything hooks in with what I just said there. There is the faith, and then there's faith that people have conjured up and come up with over the years, and that explains this proliferation of, of division that we see today all around us. Well, note then the singularity is what I'm wanting you to see of the faith. Uh, you didn't have a choice in the matter in the first century, according to Christ and his apostles and those who were teaching by inspiration. Now, the second verse, Galatians 1 and verse 7, teaches uh, that men would pervert the gospel. So circle the again, but put the word pervert in front of it in the blank place, P-E-R-V-E-R-T. You know what that means. It's to change it. It's to twist it. It's to alter it uh, from what it, the original was. The, he said there would be some who would pervert the gospel. The gospel equals the faith of the previous verse, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. Uh, now, after pointing to a time when men would not endure the sound or healthful doctrine, uh, chapter 4, verse 3, the, the third verse here, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 4, I think it's listed wrong in the book, by the way. I've corrected it here. It is verse 4, not verse 5. So you want to change that in your book. says that the time would come when men would turn away, he says, their ears from what? From the truth, thus teaching, in effect, lies or untruths. So on um, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 4, you should write in, they shall what? Two words, turn away. 
No one has any problem understanding that. God is plain here about it. Uh, they would turn what? Turn away their ears from, and it was truly listening and understanding and following, the truth. Circle the again. I'm hoping you're seeing this. The faith, the gospel, and now we have the truth. Circle the. Uh, and they would, of course, he goes on to say they would turn aside unto fables. In other words, to untruths that men have dreamed up like a, like a fable, a fairy tale in effect. All right. Notice then uh, the uh, fourth, fourth one, Romans 16, 17. It, and I think that's wrong in the book. And this, on this page, it should be 17, not 7. Uh, I was, that was a misprint probably on my part. Uh, but he predicted that men would divide up by different doctrines, in other words, or teachings. So encircle the word the in front of the doctrine. Uh, and then back up with me and look at the verse. Have the person read the verse. Again, we're going very hurriedly here just to give you the idea. We may not finish certainly all this, but we hope to give you the idea of what this is all about. Uh, he says that, uh, to, you to avoid them, to, to not go along with, in other words, those uh, which cause divisions and occasions of stumbling contrary to uh, the doctrine. So you'd want to write that in there, at least get the word divisions in there, contrary to what? The, and you've got the circled already, the doctrine. So what do we have so far from this, these verses in Scripture? The faith, the gospel, the truth, and here, the doctrine or teaching, in other words. And he goes on to say, which ye learn, and that, there, you, know, that you uh, of course, end up uh, not going that route at all is obviously the implication uh, that we're taking from each one of these verses. So, again, the fifth verse, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, we've heard that during this lectureship, even the short time that I have been here, and I'm sure it's been used many times in this lectureship, uh, and many times by members of Christ's church over the years, but it says that men began to divide up and to wear different names. But we know what Paul actually was teaching in the first century, that on matters of, uh, of, of obligation, at least, one should not do that. Now I beseech you, brethren, through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, that ye all speak the same thing, 1 Corinthians 1.10, and that there be, look at it, no divisions among you, but that ye be perfected together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That's a necessity, you see, during the first century. So where it says all speak the same thing, be no what? Fill the blank in, divisions. And then we might, and I occasionally ask a person when I'm studying with them, and I say, do you, do you understand this? Do you have any questions? Uh, and then even if they say, yeah, they understand it, they don't have any questions, I said, do you believe it? Do you believe it? What God has said here about divisions and that this is something that is, it's evil. It's not something you brag about. It's not something you make up a bumper sticker and certainly and put across the back of, uh, bumper of your car saying join the church of your choice and so forth, select what you want. Make the truth for yourself. Live in an existential little fairy tale fable world that we referred to a minute ago of making up a gospel of your own uh, concoction. No, it's not that at all. It's, it's the faith. It's the gospel. It's the truth. It is the doctrine. And there should be no divisions in going away from that, at least so far as matters of obligation uh, are concerned. Are there matters of option? Yes, there's a matter of op option, certainly so. And we've written, brethren have written much good material along that line, as most of you know, and I hope you're reading it. But uh, notice he said, but that ye be perfected together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That doesn't sound like to me that it is a cafeteria-style uh, choice of like you might have for lunch or, or supper. Uh, does it sound that way to you? Uh, at least from the Bible, you certainly could not uh, put, you'd have a very terrible task to try to find any verse in the Bible. In fact, I'll say you will not find it in which division is promoted as to matters of obligation. No, that is not the case. Where one person can say, well, you can sprinkle or pour for baptism instead of immersion. Another comes along and says, well, you can do all three, like Rolf and some of the other speakers I've already mentioned. The Roman Catholic Church and others will say, take your choice. It doesn't matter. And what you're saying is it doesn't matter what God has said through his word to you 
And that's why I like this situation of sitting beside a person and it being one-on-one. -on -one. And yes, I do hold back. I know some of you have trouble believing this, but I let them read the verses. I let the, oh, yeah, it'd be a whole lot easier for me to do it. But it's let them read it. Let the truth of God's word, the sword of the spirit, Ephesians 6 and verse 17 is what? Sword of the spirit is what? The word of God. And let it then pierce their heart or mind or conscience. The truth goes in, and they will normally, I said, it's in almost 100% success, at least in the times that I, many times I have used this, especially in the seven years that I was in San Antonio. Well, we've got to keep going here. But the sixth verse there on that chart says that men would draw other men away from the truth, from God's church. And this is found, of course, in the book of Acts, and you'll know, and I'll leave it to you to, to determine the context there as far as Paul speaking, you know, of course, the eldership there. But he says in verse 29 of Acts 20, I know that after my departing, Paul says, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock, and that from among your own selves, in other words, in not only Christians, but inside the eldership, uh, he says, and from among your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things. Why? What's the motivation? He sa tells us. He says to draw away the disciples after them. It's to get your own group going. It's to get your own following. See, and not, be sati not being satisfied with what God has set forth uh, about the New Testament uh, church. So in, act in, that, in those blank places, of course, you would want to fill in Speaking what? Perverse things to what? Draw, D-R-A-W, away the disciples. So put draw away the, in the, in the blank place there, disciples after them. So what do we have? Well, in a, by way of summary, note the summaries listed there. To depart, and I've given this, explained it earlier that I didn't deal with. It means to turn away from. The Bible promised that departures would come. Some would depart from the faith. Some would pervert the gospel. Some would turn away from the truth. Some would cause divisions contrary to what? The doctrine. Uh, some would divide the original unity of the apostolic church. Some would draw men away from the New Testament church. And these departures came exactly as God promised that they would. Many, many face today are the, are the result then of this situation and what God has told us ahead of time was going to happen and we see it did happen. Had they not come, had they not come, it's sort of a strange thing, denominationalism is in a sense a proof of God's word and that he tells the truth. Denominationalism came to fruition just as he predicted. Had they not come, God's predictions of apostasy, don't you see, would be false. Now, again, that's where I set forth the argument that I started with uh, for this lesson. Uh, and note, uh, God did not cause, of course, denominationalism. He just simply foresaw its existence. He foresaw that it was going to come. That ought to mean something to us, that we can count on God's word. It is impossible for God to lie. Uh, he doesn't wake up like, like we humans sometimes do and decide, hmm, I don't know, let's see, it's Sunday uh, it's, uh, you know, February such and so. I, you know, I might just decide to tell humans lies today. That's not God. That doesn't happen. With humans, we can, uh, being finite, we can lie. It's possible for a human to lie, but it's counterfactual about God. He cannot lie due to his very nature of he is the truth. Just as we say, John and others are saying God uh, is love, uh, you can just as well say from Scripture, God is is truth and what God says is reality even if it's in a predictive form it will come to pass we even have what's called the prophetic perfect in the Hebrew uh, Old Testament in which we see that something is spoken of is already happening when it actually hasn't happened yet why because God has said it's going to happen it's just that certain uh, with him so again God did not cause denominationalism but he foresaw uh, it's coming. Now, page two, go to the chart number two, which says before departures came. Uh, what was the situation? You've got to see this. Everyone needs to see this. So the second page asks uh, how original, in fact, I want you to uh, circle at the top of the page the word original there. 
original Christianity was before men departed from it, just as God's word predicted. And then right above the word original, I want you to write this word, originated. O-R-I-G-I-N-A-T-E-D. Write the word originated right above after you circle the word original on that chart. Put small circles now over to the right where you see the gospel perverted, the truth turned away from. I want you to draw circles at the end, a pretty good sized little circle there so you can put some words inside it uh, right past uh, each end word there, right where the arrow points to the right. Draw a circle on each one of those. You should have one, two, three, four, five, six. You should have six circles drawn there that are blank right now, but you're going to fill them in in just a second. Uh, now, the, you put those small circles there right after those arrows to show that different gospels, uh, in fact, the word lies, uh, the word faith, the word doctrines, the word divisions, and also churches. So in the first small circle right there, where we're moving away from the Bible and the gospel, what happened? We have the, the gospel was perverted into what? Gospels. Put G-O-S-P-E-L-S. Be sure and put an S on the end of it. Gospels. And men did that, not God. In the second place, or second circle, where it says the truth on the Bible, and hopefully I want you to circle sooner or later, circle all those the that are on that Bible right there. We've already done it, but the gospel, the truth, the faith, the doctrine, the unity, the church. It's noting the singularity of what God wants and what he has said. This is not something some human who was a member of the Church of Christ or what some people like to label Campbellism. I remember years ago, I guess I was 14 or 15 years old, someone called me a Campbellite, and I didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> In one way, that's a, that's a good thing, isn't it? And I just knew what the Bible said, and I could uh, show scriptures and what I held. In another sense, perhaps, maybe I should have been taught a little more about it and how to combat that type of mentality. So, but here's what we're doing. We're going to the Bible and seeing this, and this cut through all this fog that people lay out and giving all these little subjective uh, statements and so-called answers uh, to some of us. But notice, the gospel was converted into the gospels. The second one there... The, from the truth, it was what? What happened? The truth was, remember, turned away from and put the word lies then, L-I-E-S. It's not the truth. Some would say, well, Terry, you're judging motives. Well, you can still be telling an untruth, perhaps, and it not be a flat-out lie of meaning to lie, but it is still the devil's lie, I'll tell you that much. He means for us to have lies. He means for us to believe untruths. And he'll use anyone, even someone who's somewhat innocent in their belief part about it and motive, uh, he'll still use them to teach you a lie to cause you to not obey God's truth. But Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the what? The truth, and the truth shall make you free. You can't be free from your sins unless you know what God has said in his word. So in the second place then, the second circle would just be put in there, lies. Be sure that S is on the end again in a plural sense. In the third place, put the word faith. I'm going to have to skip some comments that I would normally make in studying with someone when we're going slower. But it, the, faith, the faith was departed from, and it was changed into men's faith, F-A-I-T-S. Be sure the S is there. In the fourth place, what happened? We had the doctrine. But the doctrines we saw from these verses earlier has been corrupted into what? Now, two words on this circle, different doctrines. Be sure the S is on there. Different doctrines from what? The doctrine of Christ as revealed, actually, in uh, the New Testament. And in the fifth place, then, write the word for the unity of the unity of Scripture that was demanded in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 and other verses by Paul and others, and in Jesus' prayer, in John 17, in fact, about being one, the unity was divided into disunity. Disunity. You might underline D-I-S to be sure to draw someone's attention to it when they're writing that down in that blank place. And in the sixth place, of course, there was the church. Everybody knows that. I've asked for years now, practically all my life, I've asked people when the Ethiopian eunuch came up out of that water in Acts 8, and he went on his way rejoicing. What denomination was he a member of? And to every person, I'm not saying I won't run into somebody because I'm, I'm you know, it may happen, I suppose. 
But it hasn't happened yet. Everyone looks up and says, well, he wasn't a member of any denomination. Right, exactly. Most everybody knows that. Uh, there were no differing denominations, you see. Uh, there was just the church. And you were added to it, Acts 2 and verse 47, by your compliance with the will of God as set forth uh, in uh, the scripture. You see, this takes out all these things about, well, my grandpa was this, and my grandmother was that, and, and, or my son, he preaches for the such and such denomination. I don't care what he does. He has got in you and I, all of us have to deal with these scriptures and these scriptures teach the way it really was and is or ought to be today. So now after that last one where you had many churches right there, uh, I'm asking you in the material in the chapter that that, of course, to rep, um, uh, place the, word, uh, the number 1,200 to represent the approximate number of churches in North America. That's the last count I could find on it. Approximately 1,200, just put that right out from saying many churches. Has been, we've been led away from the church that we know is in Scripture to believing that you can take the church of your choice and all this and have all these differing uh, conglomerations of doctrines that are contradictory to one another and so forth. And I don't mean just in matters of option. I mean in matters of obligation. Baptism in this one group says it is essential for mission of sin. And another group across the street says, no, it's not. Somebody's wrong, or you're going to say that God is saying A and He's saying B at the same time, and they're contradictory to each other. Really, technically, it would be A and not A, and God approves of that. No, He doesn't. It's an insult to God to even say that, and certainly an insult uh, to, to Scripture to claim that it teaches and binds that or teaches that uh, to people uh, today or at any time. Now, near the word now, right down there in that right hand. Uh, corner uh, slot right there where it says N-O-W right again 2012 right there and of course as you use this through the years you obviously just have them right you know whatever the present year is now think about it this way a spring of pure water in fact I want you to write above where you wrote originated above original I want you to write the word spring S-P-R-I-N-G so you have that metaphor in your mind spring Write that right over the word originated where you wrote that. Now, a spring of pure water which flows down through a city's sewage, uh, garbage and filth, you know, and so forth, is contaminated by men sometimes. But pure Christianity, so to speak, has flowed through about 2,000 years now of men's changes and has come to us contaminated. That's what we're trying to illustrate here. Now draw, I just draw, have them draw a wandering arrow from the word spring at the top of the page. Draw that down through those other, uh, the things listed here, of how the gospels were perverted into go in, in the, go the gospel, into, into gospels, into lies, into faith, into differing doctrines, into disunity, and into many churches and so forth. Go right on through. And you'll see that uh, now from almost the same six verses used in the previous page, and they answer this uh, brief question then on each one to focus the person's mind or your mind back on the original Christianity before anybody changed anything. Back when the spring was pure, and underneath before departures came, you see what we're doing. According to Galatians 1.8, uh, there were, with God's approval in the Bible, how many gospel messages? Well, how many were there, folks? You know it? One is exactly right. One, write in one right there. Have them write it in, but be sure they understand it, and then ask them, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Just keep asking that. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 4, before turning away, did all believe the same truth, yes or no? Yes, write in the word yes, if you believe that. If you don't, then, of course, you don't want to put a yes. 1 Timothy 4, 1, what did the Spirit say some would depart from? The faith and circle the again. We need to emphasize that to people. This takes it away from us just being this judgmental, bigoted, narrow-minded, sectarian group which thinks it's the only ones going to heaven. Hey, I'll tell you, it's like Brother Dub McClish, I think, said, uh, and one barber was cutting his hair. Dub, you remember something along this line, I think. 
and a guy spoke up and was talking to another guy there, and he said, and he found out Dub was a preach, gospel preacher, and he said, oh, you remember that group, you know, thinks you're the only ones going to heaven, and before Dub could say anything, apparently his own barber spoke up and said, I'll tell you, it's worse than that, he doesn't even believe all of his own brethren are going, and that's right, that's exactly right. Is every member of the church, just because you've been baptized and have a little baptismal certificate, some preacher or somebody gave you, you're in, you're in like Flynn, you're, you're saved, can't be lost? Oh, no. Oh, no. But what does, it's not a matter of what we think or you think. It's a matter of what does Scripture say. In Romans 16, uh, 17, before divisions came, did all teach one doctrine? You look at that verse. The answer is yes. So you write in and have them write in yes. 1 Corinthians 1, 10, were all Christians commanded to teach alike? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Acts 20, verse 28 and 29, before wolves came in, was the church one flock? Yes or no? Yes. And then you see the summary there. And you see what you're doing with this. We've hopefully uh, got you going on this. I hope in the next uh, week or two, uh, as you have time, you will do the rest of it. Notice the next page. Some of the other lectures certainly fit in with chart three. I hope that you'll use that, but have that person go through those verses. Some of them, yes, it is a little repetitious in a place or two, but I found that, like Brother Massey did, that that is somewhat necessary, especially for certain people, for them to get to see, you know, uh, what is going on. And point 10 on that page is crucial. Nine and 10. Uh, a divided house cannot stand. Every religious group which God did not plant shall be what? Rooted up. Now ask the person. I've done this. I say, what does that mean, rooted up? What does that mean to you? What does that, what does that phrase mean to you? And I'm telling you, if it, it's starting to come home to them now. And they're seeing the truth is the truth and error is error. And they are not one and the same thing. You go on, of course, to chart four, which is what must we do? Go through that, and we've, we've led you along the same way that I've done this morning, to, for you to go back behind all departures, to make a 180-degree turn and come back to original uh, Christianity, to contend earnestly for what? The faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints. The faith is right from Scripture, not just because I grew up in a Christian home, saying my grandfather, like he mentioned a minute ago, was a Christian and a gospel preacher, that proves nothing. I had another grandfather who was basically nothing. What does that prove about anything to do with God's truth? And I'll tell you, absolutely nothing. What proves something is what does God's word actually say? And then the final question is, do you care enough to teach and preach it? To, to be careful with God's word as we're taught over and over. Now, regardless of the uh, failure of others uh, in departing from God's revealed desire, we must reveal his word in order to truly demonstrate our love uh, for him, for Christ, and the Holy Spirit. John 14, 15, that simple verse, but Jesus said, If ye love me, what? Ye will keep my commandments. Not some subjective think so that you uh, have come up with. So again, I hope that you'll follow up this. I hope that you'll get all four of these sheets for yourself from one source or another. Sister Massey, I'm sure, will be happy to send those to you. She did have a cassette tape by Brother Massey in his own voice going through some of this material. Uh, and I hope, I don't know whether she has it on CD now or not. I need to ask her that. But I hope that you'll get that and use this, folks. We have nothing to be ashamed of about this because we've got scripture for it. And that, in the final analysis, John 12 and verse 48, what's going to judge us? Right. Christ's word and those whom he deputized or authorized to teach his word, and we best be found uh, in Christ. We appreciate your attention, and I do hope this will prove useful to you uh, in teaching not only your own family, your relatives, neighbors, and friends, but anyone whom you come in contact with. Don't be afraid to do it. It's really, you don't have to be a, some sort of a, I have an IQ of an Einstein to be able to teach this simple material. You can do it. And we best be about that job. <clears throat>